What's up, Eve? Hey, hey Coach Chappie. And uh, to be official, I, we are friends. So. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you for that distinction. <laughs> I didn't know if I <laughs> was uh, stepping over, out of bounds with that one. Uh, but again, thank you very much for agreeing to this, for agreeing to do the show with us. Uh, it's a second episode. It's fairly new. We're still, you know, feeling ourselves out. And it's really a great honor to have you in the show, man. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure. Uh, thanks for inviting me and welcome to the digital world. I've been doing what you're doing right now. That's cool. Many, many times. And I know how difficult it is. You're a one man show over there. So yeah, uh, awesome <laughs> content and I'm happy to be on. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Uh, again, so for everybody who's viewing over on Facebook, uh, do you have a Facebook page, Eric? Yes, I have um, one for my website, which is, I think it's the official Eric Mank okay. website. And then I have my personal page as well. But. All right, so maybe we'll share that later on. Uh, but really, I, the reason why I invited you, aside from all of the conversations we had uh, you know, late at night in our hotel room, um, you really have a lot of great insight when it comes to playing in the, playing in the league, playing locally. But also you had that unique experience of playing in Europe even before you entered uh, the country. Uh, so, um, but before we get into that, right now you are already coaching, right? So you are, well, before the season ended, you are one of the assistant coaches of Ala Filipinas and you've been doing it for two years now. So I wanted to ask you, how has the transition been from being a player to now being an assistant coach as part of the staff? Um, it's been you know it is an adjustment um there's being a coach um you know obviously i have a lot of experience playing and i was a veteran player i played until i think uh, my early 40s even so yeah it's just it's just a thing of having all this experience and knowledge that's one thing but the the communicating that to somebody who doesn't know as much as you who you know the two teams that that i've been a part of coaching they're pretty young teams. You know, a lot of guys were straight out of college or maybe one or two years of experience. So, you know, as a player, I'm used to playing with veteran guys that kind of know what they're doing. So talking through those problems are, is usually pretty easy. But yeah. when you're coaching a young team, expressing what you know at a much more elementary level than that I'm used to uh, was a bit of a challenge. And then it's also a confidence thing. I thought my second year I was much more confident mm. and knew more what my role would be than the first year. First year I kind of was quiet and kind of uh, was a little unsure of myself, which sounds weird, but <laughs> it's just, it was the first time that, that I had coached, been, been a part of a team as a coach, I guess. Yeah. Um, so like, I, like what I was saying, uh, I think a lot of coaches go through this path. So they start off first as an assistant coach. Rarely do you see somebody like Coach Jimmy, I guess, who goes straight into being uh, a head coach. Uh, do you think in the future, and this isn't part of the questions that I sent you, but do you think in the future, will this help you in the long run in terms of having that experience first as an assistant coach before eventually taking on a head coaching gig? Definitely. You sh there's always a learning curve. You, you never know everything, right? So even though I was fairly well versed in basketball, I've been around a team and been watching basketball my whole life. Um, coaching is, is completely different being on a staff and uh, being responsible for some of the team is completely different. So learning this side, having a couple of years to learn this side, I think it will, will help me in the future or help me if I become a head coach later. Do you think that your experience being an assistant coach for Alab for the past two years uh, and being under Coach Jimmy and being uh, ex exposed to all of the other coaches there, uh, will it, is it something that uh, you recommend a coach to do before he jumps into being a head coach? Yeah, definitely highly recommended. I would never want to be a head coach right out of the <laughs> gate, especially at, at the yeah. professional level. Um, uh -huh. It's just tough. You got to learn as much experience as I had as a player. It's just, it's totally different working with a staff and um, 
just you you have to it's baby steps right you, you can't yeah uh, jimmy uh, luckily for him it's worked out and he's done a great job they're just commendable to him but he's in a that's a tough situation and he got definitely thrown into the fire so uh, kudos to him for doing a great job but every coach should be an assistant to at least know uh first of all learn from the people you're around but also yeah. you have to know that end to really to to be good at the so you can coach your assistant coaches as well yes yeah i agree I agree um i i asked because personally i was oh that that's actually what happened to me my first ever coaching job. It wasn't in the professional leagues, but uh, I, th I think you know this. I was a head coach for a high school basketball team. And we went, I think, three and a half years without winning anything. As in Ooh, literally ouch. not winning anything. So that was a pretty difficult time. But um, I do agree now in hindsight, let, like, like what they say, hindsight's always 20-20. Uh, I could have used the mentor when I was coaching. That's uh, the best the thing. Time. Almost for anything you do, you need – the best way to become a good head coach is to be an assistant under a excellent head coach, I think. Having a mentor Agreed. in anything yes. is, is very valuable. Yes. Saying what's up, of course, to uh, Nico Yabut. You know Nico, right? <laughs> Nico Shuni wow. right now. All right. So uh, we're going to move on to our next question. So – uh, uh, not a lot of people know, at least locally, that you have a book. You actually wrote a book, right? So this, this, yeah. you actually wrote the book, and you told me about this, and I was surprised. But um, knowing that you do write uh, for blogs, or you used to blog a lot before, and you did write for a lot of publications, most recently with ABS-CBN, is that right? That's right. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So, uh, so what? Um, were you always into telling stories? Did you always have that habit of writing? Or is it something that you developed through time? Or is it something that I just, uh, you know, found out later on after your career as a basketball player was over? I kind of found, you know, I've always enjoyed uh, storytelling and story, but I, I was the furthest thing ever from a writer. I was, uh, I never wrote anything, um, <laughs> but, I, don't know, I guess when I was done or towards the end, when I was getting done playing, I was, I just started to journal a lot and started yeah. to write a lot. And I just took it from there. And that, that ended up being a, uh, you know, a 300 page book, uh, 300 page plus book. And then um, that ventured off into what is actually published now, which is just a 94 page book. And then I just started writing. I just thought I could do it. So yeah, um, I just kind of took it as a challenge and uh, made a lot of mistakes. But... <laughs> <laughs> what 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 was the book uh, for the benefit of those who are? Oh uh, well, okay. So when I was getting, I, I basically this is going to sound. I, I think this is going to sound horrible, but I wrote an autobiography, right? <laughs> and okay. I thought it was going to be this great thing. And I spent a lot of time doing it. I spent a lot of money getting it edited. Um, Rafe Bartholomew edited, edited oh, yeah. it. Um, so, but then what happened is I still have it. It's basically 95% done. I just got to get a cover for it and, and publish it. But I got like a lot of, I've heard this happened a lot. A lot of authors kind of uh they shy away they, they do all the work which i did it took me yeah. years to do and then when it's time to publish it for the public they don't do it so that's kind of what i did yeah. and it wasn't for it wasn't for any reasons that i'm embarrassed or anything it's just that i don't know i don't i don't know how valuable it is like for me it was a good way of kind of uh how do you say, like getting my career and my thoughts uh, yeah. of my basketball life down on paper yeah, and kind of as, as almost closure, right? So, cause yeah. like many athletes, I didn't really know what I was going to do next. And mm. I just kind of, you know, just got my thoughts out there and I was, I was all set to publish it and everything. And, but then I still have it and I still may publish it, but it wasn't something that I was super, I just kind of feel as time has passed that I don't know how important it is. <laughs> That's all. 
I think you should. <laughs> I mean, speaking as your friend, I think eventually uh, people are very curious about the life of a basketball player, especially one who comes from a foreign country and then enters uh, enters the Philippines at the time, uh, which I'm going to just jump into this question right now, uh, because at the time when Philamps started going into the, uh, the country, uh, this was a... Uh, you actually started playing in the PBL and then you eventually uh, played in the PBE. I know this because you know this also. My dad used to coach for Shell, right? Yeah. And in your first year in the PBA, uh, Shell went up against Tanduay uh, for, I, I forgot if it was an all Filipino. It might, might have been all Filipino. Yeah, it was. So it was my first conference yeah, so, in the PBA. Exactly. And, and back then, you were already a problem. <laughs> but uh, what I wanted to ask was, uh, what was it like playing in the PBA at the time when Philams just started making it in the league? Uh, how was it like playing in a foreign country far away from home? And was there an experience as a Philam early on in the career that really stood out? Um, well, that's a lot to unpack there. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I was living my dream. And it was a dream come true for me to be able to play professional basketball and then to be in the Philippines um, was, it was a wonderful experience. You know, the PBA was, was what I would think is a lot bigger then than it is now, as far as uh, the crowds were bigger and it just seemed like a lot more people were paying attention, I think, uh -huh. then. So really, you know, there were some down uh, moments a couple, you know, a couple years later, or a year or so later. But when I was first starting out in those years, it was nothing but positive experience for me. I was meeting new people. Everybody liked me. Um, I was on the right team. My coach was gave me uh, a lot of opportunity to play. Um, yeah. So I, I kind of, but then you know, it led to something else, which no. there's there was a whole. We were kind of uh, when I say we, like the the Philam players at that time uh we were kind of the new guys which at first mm. everyone really liked mm. and then it, it at some point it turned a little bit um as yeah. far as and a lot of that looking back a lot of that was something that uh one of the big challenges of, of playing here is what we kind of what we talked about earlier is i didn't have a mentor i was here by myself i didn't have any friends when I first got here um you know I wasn't like our friend Danny who had an older brother like I didn't have nobody was <laughs> yeah. nobody was helping me out or, or or helping me with hey this is the culture here um yeah maybe you shouldn't act like this because it might rub these guys the wrong way or maybe you should mm. do this you know no one was really helping me out as long as I played well that was all anyone really cared about so and I was fine yeah. with it too, but so there were some challenges. Um, but for the most part, uh, the way the fans treated me and the way that I was treated and uh, living the dream and and meeting new friends was was a great experience. Mm. But um, um, was there was there something else I didn't cover there? No, <laughs> it was really just uh, well jumping off that before that actually like what i mentioned earlier you actually played in europe i didn't know this so uh, how long did you play for uh, in europe and was it the commercial league was it the professional league? yeah i played in denmark which is low level europe um and i was there for eight months i was there from august of 96 until maybe april of 97 so eight months i was there and actually that time you know, I'm glad I went there first before I came to the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, just because yeah. I, I was really homesick there. It's sound funny, but uh. I was very like my dad. My dad was, was in, in, the, in the military for eight years. So he used yeah. to tell me about being homesick. And I was always like homesick. That's for that's for pussies. Like, I'm not. Why would I be homesick? <laughs> I can't fucking stand yeah. my dad. You know, <laughs> I can't wait to get away from that guy. What are you talking about? Homesick. Okay. And I get over there and I'm like, dude, there's like no food that is what I'm used to eating. I got no friends. Yeah. 
I'm in a city. I don't know anybody. And back then there was hardly any internet, you know? So uh, I was super homesick and I played like shit because of it. Like literally <laughs> my body hurt. Everything hurt. I couldn't sleep. It was horrible um, for like four months, a long time. And then, uh, but I got that out of my system. I ended up playing better and my experience there was great. Yeah. But then when I came here, I, I was over it already. Like I was used to being away and having everything not be yeah. like it was in college or whatever. So, yeah, Wikipedia says you averaged 19 points in in Europe. Is that right? Average yeah, I did. Points in I Europe. did. I did all right. The second half of the year, I played very well. The first half of the year, mm. I played horrible. <laughs> so you needed that time to adjust. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Uh, okay, so next question. Uh, this question is actually, I asked uh, Jimmy the same thing, but uh, you, you know, you know that Jimmy's a, a creature of habit, right? Are you the same? Oh, yeah. Are you also a creature? Of, <laughs> are you also a creature of habit? And did you have any specific pre or post game rituals that you used to do when you were playing? Um, I am. I like a routine. I don't know if, okay. uh, you know, I guess everyone's kind of a creature of habit, right? But I didn't, I wasn't superstitious or anything. I was very meticulous on my diet leading up to mm. a game um, or leading up to just when I got older, it was just like every day I had to eat a certain way or, or I just wouldn't have worked. But um, I would say that would be the most, as far as um, things that I had to do or things that just to, had me feel confident going into the game was mostly my diet or stuff, but I didn't have any superstitions, superstitions or any rituals or anything that I would go through. Okay. All right. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, for those of us, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, well, E, uh, whenever we eat out, whenever we're on the road and we eat out, uh, usually beside E, and then <laughs> whenever some guy or a player walks over with a plate load of like chicken nuggets or anything that's unhealthy, <laughs> he always has the best one-liners <laughs> when he sees these guys. And it's always about somebody popping an artery or something like that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, but yeah, but yeah Eric has, is really, has really got the health thing down, uh, as you can see with those uh, guns that he has right there. <laughs> so, uh, one of the things also I noticed about you is that you always carry a book whenever we travel. So I know yeah. that you're a big reader. Uh, I know that you are a big reader. What's on your reading list right now? If you have. Oh, one. man. And, oh, man. Yeah, yeah. And, Go ahead. And as a follow up, as a follow up to that is what are two or three books that you can recommend for people to read? Just just to be better people, I guess. No, oh, OK. Um, well, let me get my phone out here because I have a. Sure. I've been killing books on this lockdown. Um, <laughs> where is it? Okay, so what I'm reading right now, I'm reading a book called On Strategy by uh, John Lewis Gaddis, which is a book on leadership. Uh, it's pretty okay. thick reading, but it talks about uh, leaders of the past, like uh, Napoleon, or I just finished a chapter on Abraham Lincoln. Um, so history it's it's kind of thick reading so i'm reading that right now okay um what's it called again on strategy on grand strategy on grand strategy okay. yeah um so over this lockdown i'm gonna give i've read four books raising lions i read which is a great book uh for for parents okay. um i just got done reading deep work by cal newport which is deep work uh, yeah, deep work. And then I read Stealth War, which is about uh, the Communist Party in China. And uh, oh. I read, <laughs> yeah. So we're all, we're all getting real familiar with that here recently. Yeah. And, and I read, <laughs> yeah, it's actually a really good book, an eye-opening book. And then uh, I okay. read How I Raised Myself from Failure to Success in Selling by Frank better so that's what i've wow. read that's what i've read um over this <laughs> lockdown but um yeah so tour on my list to to from here are 
the compound effect, uh, one up on Wall Street, Atomic Habits, and Talent is overrated. Mm. So have you read any of those? I've read, well, I've glanced over Atomic Habits. I am currently reading, actually, a, a biography on Leonardo da Vinci. Um, Ooh. So Walter Isaacs on. Uh, very wow. great biographer. Uh, he did the, uh, he did also on Prestige Jobs, and uh, well, he's one of the best biographers out there. Um, yeah, so that's a that's a lot of books. So I'm I'm gonna ask you for a list uh, so that we can share it in the show notes uh, okay. afterwards when we have the audio okay. version. But I I got my Question recommendations. From... I got my recommendations. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yeah, <laughs> the, the two or three books. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. So um, one is Extreme Ownership. Oh yes. By yes. Joko Willink. Yeah, I yeah. try to read that uh, once or twice a year. I've read it probably four times. And right after our season ended, I read that. I read that book again. Um, mm. can't, can't recommend it enough as far as uh, just leadership and just life in general. Um, there's another book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Um, he had, It's a three-book series. One is called The... I get them mixed up because there's the art of war, right? This yeah. one's the, the the war of art. The war of art. Yes, there's that okay. one, okay. and then okay. by Stephen Pressfield. So don't get those mistaken. And then the last, <laughs> um, yeah, I just leave those two. Those two are pretty good. But I will say this: I'm okay. reading a lot of things now on because my life was so hyper focused on basketball. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm reading more things now that are, I don't read, as you notice, all those books I just named have none of them, none have of them to do are. anything with athletics or yeah. uh, basketball, right? So yes. trying to Love it. be a little bit more well-rounded. <laughs> I, I myself actually have not finished my copy of the book that you recommended before, uh, Sapiens. I need to finish mm, that. That yeah. That's I, another I one. Yeah. It's a, it's like kind of like a brief history of uh, of humankind. Another yeah, it's a little um, you know, it's a little evolution, you know, for all yeah. you religious folks out there. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how you're gonna like it, but I it's highly recommend it for anyone that's a sapien, and that includes okay, you, yeah. Chappie. I know, I know, I'm on it, I'm on it. <laughs> all right, so we have a, our first question from Facebook, uh, Coach Eric. This actually relates to the Philam question, if you don't mind. So. Uh, there came a time where in, uh, there's a scare or people were sh uh, kind of shooing away the lambs. We all know this. Uh, the, 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 yeah. We used to call it the, the Phil Sham controversy. Uh, were you ever, did you ever feel that you were being pushed away? Uh, not because of legality, but because of the threat that your skills posted. So you all know, we all know that you're an exceptional player. Did you feel that people were trying to use the issue of the Phil Shams to kind of push you away or kind of label you like a sham? Uh, great question. Actually, um, yeah, great question. <laughs> I think, you know, it's, it's a weird thing because I think looking back, you know, at the time, it was, I kind of felt that at the time where I kind of okay. felt like people were, uh, you know, hey, I'm a good player. Uh, let's see if, you know, I, I don't know. It was, it was kind of, that's how I felt at the time. But looking back at it now, from where I sit now, you know, there was a lot of bullshit going on, right? Like hmm. there were a lot of people coming here that were saying they were Filipino that weren't, right? So that wasn't yeah. me, but I got lumped into that group because I grew up in America. It's as simple as that. So they people were just trying to regulate who was actually filipino and who wasn't right so yeah uh, and unfortunate it's unfortunate that that's how it went down but there there was a lot of cra craziness going on from not just the individual players but those individual players don't get to the philippines without help mm -hmm. right without you know whether it be agents or whether it be uh, management of teams. There was a lot of people helping yes. facilitate that. A lot of people, yes. those people never got in trouble. It was uh, always yes. just <laughs> the players who got strung through the mud. So I get called Phil, a Phil Sham all the time. 
on my YouTube channel, people still go on there and call me really? fake Phil Lamb. So there's a lot of haters out there and you know, there's nothing that that's something that people will always ask me about, something I'll never be able to live down, but I was never fake a fake Filipino. And, yeah, we all um, know that, yeah. <laughs> and for whatever reason, that that's just the way that it happened. But I don't think it was anything personal or if it was anything. They were just like there was just a lot of shit going on back then that, that they were yep. yeah. trying to clean up uh after the fact, right? There was no yes. rules in place. So everyone broke the rules and then they tried then to they fix do. it, but they they kind of did it wrong. So I don't know. Yeah. And because of that, I know there was a lot of there was a lot of collateral damage because of that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, as, as we can hear from you, uh, this is something that really still, aff- I, I guess it affected you even just a little bit. I mean, best with you. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's just weird. The, the whole Phil Ham thing, I haven't talked about this in a while, but. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, I I don't want to get too deep into it, but... It, yeah, you don't have to. <laughs> at first, you know, the Philippines was like a really nice place uh, to help. I, I found... Uh, it was I was finding my identity then, right? So then, you okay. know, to, for people to question that became a bit of a sensitive subject, as you can imagine. Yeah. yeah. All right. So... Thank you for that question, Luther. Uh, we're going to go back to my set. Um, so ju- uh, jumping from all of the books that you mentioned, it's pretty obvious that you love to read and that I would I really call you a lifelong learner. Somebody who really goes out there and tries to get as much information as he can and decides uh, which one is uh, substantial and not. So where did this come from, this thirst for knowledge that I know that you have? And when you take something on, is there a particular structured learning plan that you follow? Or do you just find something interesting and try to do a deep dive or try to find out more? How do you, how do you go about your learning? Uh, I guess that's, that would be the question. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't say there's anything structured. Or I don't consciously do anything structural, uh, structural okay. learning pattern or anything. Um, I just try, you know, I, I like to, I don't know, really know where it came from because when I was younger, I was a, I was a dummy. Like the, the only thing, the only thing I cared about was basketball and girls. That's it. <laughs> and and yeah. like, I, I remember I, I this is how, here's an example of how dumb I was. So I picked up, I, I wanted to read a, again, I wanted to read a book and I, I, okay. I found this, uh, a New York Times bestseller called Rich Dad Poor Dad. Have you have you yeah, heard of this book? Of course, yeah. So yeah. I was like, I was in my 30s probably, or approaching my 30s. I tried to read it and I couldn't. I couldn't. Like seriously, like 10 pages in, I couldn't. I was lost and I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't finish like 20 pages of this book. So I never really thought anything <laughs> of it. I'm like, well, fuck this, 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 this. Uh, <laughs> This book is on economics, right? Who? It's, it's yeah. stupid. I, I don't need to learn it. Well, I read that book. I have that book now, and I read that yeah. book like two years ago, and it's it's made for high school kids, for teenagers. It's the simplest book <laughs> ever. And when I was I didn't like want to 30, say anything because I read yeah, it. <laughs> it's the but most ahead, elementary finance book you could ever pick up. It's for teenagers. Okay. And when I was thirty, I couldn't get through twenty pages of it. So that's, that, I was not smart. So I don't know. I don't. I, I, what happened was I started from? listening to podcasts. Okay. That's when it started. So I started listening to podcasts. They started recommending books. And all of a sudden, I just, I don't know. I kind of grew from there. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, do, I do try to um, continually learn and analyze podcasts. Uh, things i enjoy that okay yeah, yeah. Sure. and i noticed that a lot about you of course uh you talked about a podcast so we all know that you have one of the longest running vlogs staying major right uh i don't even know how long has it been since you started staying major uh it was almost four years ago four years ago yeah so uh 
Um, so the question is, uh, describe your process in creating content. A lot of, uh, like, like right now, a lot of players, athletes, coaches are stuck at homes. You know, a lot of them are trying to get into the same game, uh, trying to get, to get into content. Not to give your secret away, <laughs> but do you have a process of creating content so that, you know, some of the younger generations, uh, yeah, uh, younger people can look up to it? Um, well, the thing is with the, you know, I've been doing mostly videos lately and, you know, my channel isn't by no means a huge uh, YouTube channel. So I'm still trying to figure out a lot of it still myself, but there is, you know, one watching a lot of YouTubes or find or YouTube videos and finding what you like and mm -hmm. finding inspiration maybe by what other people are doing, I think is the best way uh, to, to have a blueprint or at least a floor plan of kind of how you want to organize a video or a, uh, an interview like this. Yeah. So, but, but other than that, it's just being, being creative and just thinking through the process of, and, and creating an outline. Like you have to have write yeah. down an outline so you're not just going in blind. Like, what do you want to ac yeah, accomplish with this you video? You told me this. <laughs> yeah, like you can't just bring your camera around and make up stuff as you go. Like have a topic, create an outline, and then fill in the blanks while you're recording. That 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 would be the yes. basic thing that uh, <laughs> uh, a semi-pro <laughs> content creator no, that was, would advise. That's the same <laughs> the same advice you gave me actually I, when I told you I was going to start a podcast way back, which I didn't start. So I finally started <laughs> it here. And I did write an outline just to, uh, just to tell you. <laughs> good, All right. Good. So do you know Joe Fish? Joe Fish? Do you know Joe Yeah, Fish? I know Joe Fish. He, what's up, what's up that, Joe? He's just saying, are you glad that Jim Harbo, our San Francisco 49ers former coach, not blew you? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no what? idea what he said. But he, he wanted to say that. Can you repeat that one more time? The Jim uh, are Harbaugh. you glad that Jim Harbo, our San Francisco 49ers former coach, is now at Blue U? What's Blue yeah. U? Uh, well, he's the head coach at University of Michigan. And for the record, they are the Michigan Wolverines. And I am not fans of them at all. I am a Michigan State Spartan. But you're fan, from Michigan. So, yeah. Uh, but I'm okay. a I'm a Michigan State fan as opposed to a Michigan fan. So, okay, they're, so that, they're rivals, yeah. right? So kind of like UCLA and uh, USC. USC. Yeah, same thing. All right, all right, okay. <laughs> so it's kind of a dig. Uh, <laughs> saying what's up to, of course, uh, Joe Gino Rafino is tuned in. Also, thanks for tuning in, Gino. Says he loves how you have no filter e. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, that's gotten me in trouble but, uh, many times over the years. <laughs> I think it makes you interesting. <laughs> All right, so Nico, actually, our friend, Coach Nico, has a question. Um, which player was your toughest competition? That's a good question. Which which player gave you the most problems uh, whenever you would be matched up against with against um, them? A lot Don't of people no gave <laughs> no uh, yeah, nobody uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> a lot of people gave me problems. Um, you know, there were a lot. The, t the tougher, you know, in my era, the guys I had to guard, I, I always felt like I was at a disadvantage because, like, for instance, Danny Siegel. I had to guard Danny Siegel. Very tough. Very tough cover. He's a little bit more athletic than I am. So he gave me trouble. Uh -huh. Asi Talava. I had to guard Asi. Asi's quite a bit bigger than I am. Gave me a lot of trouble. Um, and then – <laughs> Daniel Defonso, you got to guard Daniel Defonso. Now there, they think, oh, Eric, you should be good enough to guard Daniel Defonso one on one. Well, nobody's really good enough to guard him one on one. So, so then, you know, he would have his, oh, we got no help, no help. Okay, well, now he's gonna, you know, have thirty points. So that that happened a few that, times. This is Danny Defonso. Yeah, Danny. Uh, wow. I always had to. I always had to guard one of the Dannys, and they're two totally different yeah. players. And my coach yes. just kept saying, "You guard him, and you guard him, and you guard him." And it's like, um, and then also in, earlier in my early in my career, like the the days that you were talking about, like all yeah, I came, when I was first came in the league, all the veteran players were. Mm -hmm. I was I was still around when the uh, quote unquote older players were still. 
um, okay. Play so like the Benji, like Benji Crosses, yeah. Elvin, Nelson Esaitono, yes. and I had never yeah. played against those guys before. And again, if, like if you haven't guarded a good player, um, they're going to be tough to stop. Uh, hey, <laughs> I need I need one minute to grab my charger for my computer. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We, we kind of ran over a little bit because of the technical difficulties. Uh, saying what's up while uh, E is uh, grabbing his charger again. This uh, episode is sponsored by Tanita. So if you have any questions, you can ask it over the comment section. Best question at the end of the show gets a free body fat free. scale, body fat analyzer scale from Tanita. Uh, it's going to be high tech. So when you step on it, you'll find out what your body fat is. Very, very crucial during this time when a lot of us are staying at home and want to make sure we're maintaining our weight and not gaining as much weight as we can. And uh, more importantly, uh, we not gaining any body fat. Saying what's up to my friend Irvin Keta who's tuned in. Uh, Andre right, Karakot who's also tuned in. You're back. Uh, Joe Fish says you're looking slim, E, and go green. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, thank so you. okay, so again, thank you for everybody who's uh, tuning, uh, tuning in right now. Again, uh, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. We have, I'll try to keep it in, we'll try to end in about 15 minutes. Okay, that's great. You, you, you still, you, okay, you're as still long as you okay. want, I love uh, talking. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, so um, you said you were a creature of habit. Uh, can you pinpoint? Well, first of all, you read Atomic Habits, right? So no, I, you, that's on my list. I haven't read it yet. Oh, okay, so it's on your list. So uh, uh, in Atomic Habits and also in The Power of Habit, they talk about basically the power of habits and how it helps you become a better individual, more productive individual. And I know that even if you haven't read these books, uh, you are somebody who has a routine for those uh just a little insight whenever i wake up and i'm always the last person to wake up when we're in a, a roommates he has his bed all tidied up uh, so all of his uh his this everything is clean uh i'm always ashamed because my side of the room is always dirty but his side his bed is always crisp everything is uh laid down properly so do you have the question is do you have a habit a daily habit that you cannot live without so is there something that you do every day that if you don't do it you feel like your day is incomplete um well i have a morning routine that i've been doing that uh, okay. since our season has ended um that i've done every day so uh that consists of just reading um i meditate for 10 minutes and then i go for a walk and i just added the walking part so uh, of of those I, I have to do it every day. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, to have a good day, pretty much. But I'm really happy that I added the walk to it. I walk 30 minutes just in our village um, since we've been able to, um, which has yes. been, I don't know, a couple of weeks. But I find that <laughs> I usually, it's usually 5 30 to 6 in the morning. So yeah. that, I, that I do that. So um, I'm, I'm enjoying that. I, I'm adding that to the permanent. Um, morning routine. So okay. I guess the morning routine is something that I got to do or I'm not going to have a good day, mm. uh, I feel. But the walk, especially uh, of late, is, is going to become a permanent thing, I would say. All right. No, that's great. I, I, I highly recommend what uh, E just said. Uh, I, I wish I could wake up earlier like how E does, but currently my kids sleep at midnight or even past midnight. Oh. So I just try to wake up. I know it's horrible, but I just try to wake up as early as I can to get some form of routine going on. Uh, Harvey Carey's tuned in, or maybe this is Harry, Harvey Carey the second. Is this his son? I'm not, not even, is, maybe is his son a junior? No, that's him. I'm not sure. He, he's a, okay. his well, dad then, is senior. Yeah. Okay. That's Harvey. Okay. So this is Harvey. That's up, Harvey. So Harvey's asking, looking back on your career, what is it that you are most proud of? It's a great question, Harvey. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> um, you know, I would say more than anything else really is I have a weird, the way I look back at my career is a little bit different than I would say most people do. I, I would say for me, just 
uh, having the career that I had gave me an opportunity to uh, have the family that I have now, mm. you know, by being here, like yeah. me, I, but by me playing, I was here, I met my wife, and now I have the means to support my family. That's what I'm most mm. proud of. Um, okay. The, it wasn't some game that I had or an award that I won or that stuff was great. And it meant a lot to me at the time, a hundred percent. And I was definitely way more proud of it then than I am now. But the way I look at it now, it was more, that's having the family that I have and meeting my wife or, or it sounds cheesy. Uh, I know some people no. probably want to hear that, that, uh, oh, it was this game against whoever, but yeah. um, I don't look at it that way anymore. No, I, I think that's perfectly valid. Uh, well, just speaking from somebody who has never played professionally, uh, I would think that looking outside and seeing all of you guys uh, who, who have played before, you, Jimmy, Coach Mac, even who's listening right now, Danny, and whenever you talk about what happened when you were playing, there's always that it's it's always related to where you are right now and how you are right now and how you are taking care of your family or how you are as an individual. And the way you said it, sure the game happened for you and it, it helped you a lot, but it really catapulted you to who you are right now and how you were able to take care of your family. And I think that's uh that's something that's very common actually to a lot of uh, of uh, athletes as well. Thank you for that question, Harvey. Uh, Coach Mac has another good question. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, I can't wait to hear his. <laughs> I know. So, Coach Mac, so for those who don't in Alab, so Coach Jimmy is, uh, is the head coach. Coach Mac is the lead assistant. Then Coach uh, Eric is the second assistant. And then Coach MC is the third or the scout. And then it's me and then Angelo, who's also tuned in right now, actually. Um, so, Coach Mac asks, what have you learned coaching the past two years that you didn't or you weren't aware of when you were playing? So it's a legit question. I wasn't trying to make a dig on you. But so what is one thing that you have learned coaching the past two years that you didn't or, or, you, or you weren't aware of when you were playing? Uh, I would say one thing, especially with the way Alab's season is structured and also in relation to uh -huh. the way the PBA is structured is I think the what I learned is the beginning of the season the preseason up until the first maybe three or four games is the most important part of the season because there's a huge buildup and it's a long season right you have 26 games I think in the in the ABL where in the PBA yeah. the preseason is shorter because and the seasons are shorter, so I would say in in, in relation the, in the PBA your adjustments game to game are very mm -hmm. important because there's only eleven games and the the lead up is shorter, right? But in the ABL yeah. because the lead up is longer and the season is longer, the very beginning of the season you have to establish what kind of team your identity in during yeah. that period and if you fail to do that then you're playing catch up with everybody else the, the rest of the season so great question coach mac and, uh, <laughs> and great insight yeah. <laughs> no uh and i completely agree not only because i earned my keep in the preseason i'm a trainer so that's really where i i do most of my work but i completely agree in setting the tone early in the season and early in the team uh so yes props for that coach eric uh, again, thank you for everybody who's listening or watching right now. Uh, again, if you have any questions, just ask on. Uh, we're going to try to keep this as long as I can. Uh, okay, so uh, back to my question. So uh, here's a question for you. You were arguably one of the best players or the best players whenever you were part of a team. So you were arguably the go-to guy the best player, the MVP, your MVP for one season, the PBA. Um, so the question is, uh, how were you as a leader? So were you a vocal leader? Did you lead by example? Or were you somebody who got on people's asses? Like, you know, the, the last dance just finished and we all know how Michael Jordan was as a leader. Yeah. So were you more somebody, were you a tough, were you a tough leader? 
or were you more somebody who would uh, sit somebody down, uh, sit somebody aside, and talk to them privately? So, what kind of leader? Uh, well, first, first off, I'll say that uh, my background, like my, my high school coach was a yeller, my college okay. coach was 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 a yeller, and my dad is a yeller. So, <laughs> so um, I would say I I lead by example, I guess. First, first and foremost, okay. Okay. I try to um, be a good example, a good listener, have a strong work ethic, and be a good communicator. First, hmm. uh, I would say that there were, you know, but I'm also not afraid to speak up. But, but I will, you know, playing as long as I did, and and have, the way the PBA is structured, it being the 11 month, 10 month season. <laughs> the the yelling yeah. gets the yelling gets old right okay so it's not i learned uh, very quickly that okay. that type that it's not going to work and and it's it's not going to be great uh especially in the in the culture here um mm. so it's important to consider all those things and then Honestly, I think one of my shortcomings was I wasn't very good at pulling guys aside or I wasn't very good at uh, bringing guys together off of the court. Um, some of the things that I know Jimmy's really, really good at and is really strong at, those were some of my weaknesses. I was kind of like, hey, I'm going to come in. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to be a, try to be the best teammate I can. And, you know, when, when it's over, I, I could have been – I was very uh, – how do you say it? Abrasive, right? So there, mm. there wasn't any. I could have been better at having <laughs> personal connections. Let's just say that. Okay. So, uh, that would be a weakness of mine. And I, I, there were many. There were years where I wasn't a very good leader, especially, I don't know, not later, not like somewhere in the middle. There, I got a little lost and kind of got detached mm. from from teammates, and and I regret that. Yeah, and, and now that you're a coach, and I notice this whenever we have practice, you're the kind of coach who kind of chooses his words whenever it's something that everybody will hear. But then when you want to talk to somebody, and I, I, I want to contradict you because you've actually gotten good at it. That we, you actually pull people aside now and show them video, show them clips, and then that's how you talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. So is this something moving forward as a coach, you think this is something that you are going to be like as a coach, somebody who really work with somebody one-on-one -on -one first before going on uh, on the yeah. major tired against a team? I mean, I think that's one of my, I don't know if it's a philosophy, but it's just good. I think it's just good communication skills, right? So I, I would much rather, I don't like yelling at people. I don't like calling mm -hmm. people out in front of, and, and the ego in professional sports is such a fragile thing. You know, like it, yeah. it, sometimes yes. it's, it's, it's very fragile, right? So, I would, I'm going to sit you down. If I see something that's not happening, that's, that's maybe you could help the team more. If it's something needs to be corrected, I'm going to sit down with you one-on-one -on -one and talk about it first. And if, if it happens again, we're going to talk about it again. We're going to talk three, four times one-on-one, -on -one, hopefully, ideally, before, if it still happens, then I got to call you out in front of the team, do something that I don't want to do. But I'm going to try to yeah. fix it one-on-one -on -one, before I might bruise your ego uh, going forward. Yeah. So that's, no, that's my sense. philosophy. Some, some coaches like to get it out in the open right away. Um, mm. But I try not to do that. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. And uh, this is something that uh, I've seen E do, like what I said earlier. Um, and I think it's also something that's healthy to do if you are only starting out as a coach, uh, especially like what he said in the professional levels, egos are very, <laughs> I guess, fragile or sensitive to some, and you gotta be careful about that. Saying what's up to Coach MC, who's also tuned in. Uh, what's up, Coach MC? The whole coaching staff's here, actually. Coach Jimmy's tuned in. Thank you, Coach Jimmy. What's up, guys? Miss y'all. <laughs> yeah, we miss you. Um, okay, so another question from Luther. Um, so he asks, uh, and, and this is right. Uh, coming in, you, you came into the league as a big man who actually could shoot. 
uh, and back then in the in the late 90s, uh, big men were still making the transition into having a decent a decent outside shot. Like I never like Benji. Benji Press, uh, the person, the, the big guy who I uh, grew up with, he never had an outside shot past 25 feet or pa past 20 feet. So is this something that you developed in the States or did you develop this over in Europe? Or was it something that uh, came out of necessity or is this really your style? Um, well, it's kind of, it's something that I developed. At, like when I was younger, I, my the strength of my game from when I was 15, until when I retired was the same, like the free throw line and down. That's like, I'm good in the low yeah. post. I'm good at the mid post. I'm good at the high post. That's the strength of my game. But I always strove to uh, strengthen some of my weaknesses. So mm. as I started getting a little bit older and started growing into my body, I had decent agility as well for how tall I was. So I had decent agility. I was always uh, worked extremely hard on my ball handling. That was something that my coaches really stressed. So in order for somebody to, to get, if I had a guy my size or bigger guarding me, I could take them away from the basket and go buy them, right? But what most big guys would do is they would sag off of me. So yeah. I, especially when I got to college, I would say 80%. 85% of my workouts would be just on my perimeter shot. And I would, I never became like a, a, sh a quote unquote shooter, but my goal yeah. always was I will make enough shots to where you, the big guy has to come and guard me a little bit. Now, if you come mm -hmm. and guard me and if you get too close, I can get by you. And if I get by the big guy, who's helping the smaller guys. So yeah. I worked very, very hard at it. But it was just something, it was, it was never a strength. It's kind of something to supplement what my strength was. It made my strength better by being able to hit that shot. And, and I yeah. wish I, I think if, you know, shooting is something that uh, you have to work out a lot. Mm -hmm. And yeah. it was something that uh, I don't know if I naturally, I, I wish I would have been a better shooter, but I don't know if it was from lack of a work ethic because I tried really freaking hard. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't because of that, I'm sure. Uh, okay, so jumping from that, uh, nowadays there are a ton, this isn't in my list of questions, but nowadays there are a ton of skills coaches out there. Like every kind of skills coaches out there. Yeah. And you all see it in the YouTube videos. You all see people going through cones, going under chairs, pushing chairs, pushing cones. I wanted to get your opinion on this, uh, ha being because we would always uh, have you take the big guys in Alab, right? You would always take the big guys, and I, I noticed that you you don't only really work in the block; you also work on their outside game a little bit. So, what is your opinion on these uh, YouTube skills coaches? Uh, do you think it's something that is crucial in today's game? In today's game, okay, so. Do you think that all of the dribble moves, all of the moves that you see out there, is it crucial for children and young athletes to learn this at this time in their careers? Oh, uh, well, to answer your question directly, uh, it is definitely not <laughs> crucial. That's for sure. I mean, it's, I'm not going to hate on, hate on the skills coaches. Like there, it's a business opportunity, right? Yeah. That, that's all it is. It's, it's a niche that, uh, is now probably saturated, but mm. 10 years ago, it was just a niche that no, not a lot of people were doing. So yeah. it's a business opportunity. And it's, it's something if, if you're going to work out and have a structured workout, I don't have a problem with it. Yeah. Um, and it, it is nice being able to handle the ball it is important. Uh, some of the stuff, I'm not going to sound like the oldest guy in the world and be like, oh, you know, <laughs> Uh, that stuff you don't need to do that stuff I'm, I'm aware that there are innovative techniques to okay. to get better but also I think it also neglects the I would say the more important part of the game which is okay. you know usually you're out there doing it one on zero or, or one one on one which yeah. means you know you're not reading the defense you're not uh, you know there's there's so much more to see than just the guy in front of you right yeah. or a chair in front of you or, or whatever so being able to uh read the defense and react 
to the defense is more important. And, and how much passing are they doing? Probably zero, <laughs> you know. So it's it's a good workout. Okay. Uh, Fair but, enough. <laughs> but I wouldn't I wouldn't that wouldn't be the my main thing if I was aspiring basketball player. <laughs> it's to find a good trainer. Like a lot of stuff you can do on your own, right? Yeah. Okay. This question is from Coach Jimmy. What's up, Coach Jimmy? All right. Uh, the big dog. Geez. No, it, it, <laughs> it's nothing big. Uh, the question is really, what's, what, what was your favorite moment from this past shortened season? So this this just this is past season that concluded. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> it was such a strange season. It was. Uh, it really was. It was an odd season. And then when we <laughs> looked like we might have had it, figured out a little bit it got pulled from us but uh yeah. there was a couple there was a couple i would say our win in thailand against mono the one we uh, won in overtime yeah that game that the, game the, was, the, the jason brickman game yeah jason right? brickman had a huge game it looked like we were losing uh i mean we were losing we were losing by double figures we were, we were, on, the, we were on the verge yeah. of getting really blown out and uh i mean we were almost in panic mode it was it was because because yep. they had beat us really bad at home like two days yep. earlier so we went there and they were kicking our ass again and we were like fuck we're gonna get our ass kicked again <laughs> and then yeah. uh brick jason brickman happened uh it was nice yeah. to see him start shooting the ball and and, and <laughs> making, making some shots uh nick king uh, had some big buckets. So the, the comeback win there, and we had just uh -huh. uh, we had just changed imports as well. So uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. There there was a couple of those. That, there was that one, and then the Hong Kong game, where at, in Hong Kong, where we okay. we won very close game. Uh, I think we yes. had to come from behind there too. Like probably those yeah. two wins. Yeah. Yep. I agree. That game in Thailand was a Jason Brickman game for those who didn't uh, weren't able to watch it. I think the ABL still has some of our games in their YouTube channel, so uh, hop onto their YouTube page. You can see some of the Alab uh, games over there. Um, yeah, so thank you for that question, Coach Jimmy. All right, so this is actually my last question, unless some of the other uh, viewers have other questions. So my question is: You've had many coaches in your playing career. Who would you say had the most impact on you as a player and also as a human being in society? So who is the coach that had the most impact on you? Uh, that's, that's a great question. I've, I have, you know, so, so many that, you know, you try to learn something from, from everybody, from, from any coach that you have. I mean, for me, my high school coach and college coach, probably my high school coach, was a huge, you know, he's the guy that really taught me what it would take to be successful. Like his main thing more than anything was work ethic and effort. Uh -huh. Like his, his teams played really hard and he kind of made a blueprint for you. Like if you want to be good, like basically you have to practice like this every day. So he had probably, he was very much a father figure to me when I was growing, growing up. Um, so those were two things that, I think are very important, very important in basketball. Um, but, you know, here, playing here, I played for Coach John Yachico for a long time. He was uh, – he opened my mind up to uh, team defense. He's a very good defensive – as far as defensive strategy goes. He yeah. – he's – I used to call him the master of, like, the double and rotate. Um, whether it be, you know, a mismatch in the post or, or ball screen defense. He had a variety of different double and rotate uh, schemes that we would practice all the time. Um, Coach Kurt Collier, uh, who's an assistant mm, yeah. with Hinebra, he, he changed the way that, that I thought the game a, lo a lot. He's a very interesting guy to, to speak with. <laughs> You won't, you won't, say. you won't um, speak much. You'll listen a lot, but but you don't say much if you talk to him. Uh, yeah, that is true. That is true. Yeah. 
those guys. <laughs> even even later, um, Coach Alice Compton. You know, we okay. We had some strange things. We kept losing in the finals there, but there were some positive things that I thought he did that I really liked as well. Like he, he he's a really good communicator and kind of the same thing. Like he'll, he's going to give you every chance to succeed and really be open in his communication. And he'll also be, he'll honestly like tell you when you're doing something wrong too, yeah. which, which I think, you know, your team needs, not everyone does everything right all the time. If you're doing something wrong, you need to be corrected and just the way, you know, it doesn't always have to be like, you know, degrading or, Hey, you screwed up, but you know, th there's a way to say things. So, um, mm. all, all those guys, I'm probably missing a couple of guys, but, but, um, try to learn something from everybody, but more than anything, like my high school coach when I was young. Uh, where did you go to high school? In Michigan, um, or... yeah, in Michigan, Charlotte, Michigan, which is, okay. it's a very small town. So, well, having played a lot in high school, I, I agree. Uh, one of the most impactful people in my life was really my high school basketball coach. And same thing as you, work ethic, a lot of heart. That was really his thing. So just because we were we came from a, a bad a bad basketball school, UP. We were a good basketball school now, but we used yeah. to be a bad basketball school back in the early uh, 2000s. All right, Coach Max. Yeah, it was. Uh, Go ahead. Just to follow up on that, like just. You know, the, the town that I was from, it was amazing because the town that I was from, our, historically speaking, our basketball program wasn't very good. And then mm -hmm. my, the coach that I played for was at our school for seven years, and we were really good then. And then after that, they weren't very good. And it was just it was uh, basically with the same kids, right, from the same town. And so, you know, it was his whole thing was just effort and, and work ethic. So it's amazing what you can change with with uh exactly stepping up your attitude and your effort yes uh coach mac one says that he misses you <laughs> he misses your back and forth debates <laughs> i guess like to argue all the time me all the time. never i never argue i don't know why oh come on <laughs> <laughs> you just miss that you just miss danny danny was the one who you argue with a lot <laughs> okay uh, okay, so I think that's it. So uh, one last question e, before I let you go. This was sure. really fun. But um, what is your piece of advice for aspiring coaches out there, uh, athletes or players, ex-athletes who want to make that jump into coaching, uh, even those who have never played the, the game before or who just has have the heart for coaching? What is your piece of advice or at least one piece of, piece of advice that you can give all of these aspiring coaches out there? Uh, I would say you know, be a willing learner and communicator, you know, try to soak up as much information as you can. And also, you know, be a go getter, try to talk to people to that might be able to help you or that, you know, or, or once you do get a, you know, your first coaching gig somewhere, don't be afraid to actually coach. I know I, I waned. It was like, oh, you know, should I say something? Should I, shouldn't I say something? You're there to coach. So, you know, approach. We have an assistant at Olive who still refuses to talk. <laughs> he's tuning so, in right now. Yeah. This guy, <laughs> this guy knows a scouting report on everybody. But when it comes to communicate it to our team, doesn't say a word. <laughs> Get your ass out there and do some coaching. That's what you're there for. That's my oh. advice. Booyah. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we won't mention you, any hope, names. Yeah, we won't mention your name. Um, no, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but great, great advice. Uh, don't be afraid to coach. Completely agree with that. Uh, this was fun. Yeah, and Coach Mac says, ha, ha. <laughs> no, so it's definitely not Coach Mac. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is this is funny uh, do you have anything going on in the next couple of days or weeks or months do you want to promote anything uh, of course the channels are always there uh what do you want to promote yeah just check me out on youtube uh i'm trying to get a video up a week one or two a week so if you just search me you'll find my channel um so i appreciate the support and thank you for having me on coach chappy this was nice. Yeah, uh, I hope to have you back again. We're gonna do a, a new series on 
certain games or series in the past uh, few, oh, well, in the early 2000s. And I'll try to bring you back on for that epic game against Talk and Text, oh, which yeah. ended up not being in the record books I know who Jimmy's <laughs> watching right now but that, that will be a great uh, uh, episode so I'll have you go with Jimmy if, if he agrees to it uh, talk about that game this was fun E thank you very much man a lot of fun thanks yeah I'm gonna let you go right now everybody thank you uh, okay coach E let me just get down <laughs> All right, so that was Coach Eric Mink. Thank you very much for uh, all of the insights, Coach E. This was a fun show, uh, fun to really live back some of the moments uh, that Alep had the past few years. Uh, again, uh, this is Inside the Dugout, uh, our second episode. So again, I wanna apologize for all of the technical difficulties early on. Uh, we had to redo the stream. And thank you again to everybody who commented, who listened, who shared, who commented. And uh, for the prize of Tanita, um, the body fat analyzer scale, we're going to give it to the early bird because the early bird catches the worm. Like what Coach Eric said, have that morning routine. So we're going to give it to Luther Ian Lim Garcia. Luther, uh, congratulations on winning your uh, scale. So we're going to get in touch with you on how to claim uh, this prize from Tanita. Thank you very much again to Tanita for sponsoring this episode of Inside the Dugout. Thank you very much to Coach Eric Menk. This was a fun conversation. We're back again. We actually have a special episode happening on Saturday. I'm not going to spoil it, but that's actually a special episode. Uh, uh, quick and a quick um, preview. It's going to be on women's sports. So that'll be an interesting uh, conversation to have on Saturday. We're going to be talking about women's sports with some very notable guests. So it's, uh, it was a fun show. Again, my name is Coach Chapi Calianta. Thank you very much for watching Inside the Dugout, and I'll see you guys next time.